All right, everyone, good evening. Welcome back to the Dunnigan Mott Music and Movie Podcast. The return of the Dunnigan Mott Music and Movie Podcast. It's been a little while, and um, I'll get into that a little bit later. But um, today we're going to be talking about the 1978 album by Black Sabbath. This week was my pick. I'm talking about Black Sabbath's 1978 album, Never Say Die. This was produced by the band themselves and um, was the final album to feature the original lineup and the final to feature Ozzy until 2013's 13. So, um, yeah, it's been a little while since we've recorded, about two, two and a half weeks, three weeks, something like that. And um, the last the last album that we did was... Um, the Cream Wheels of Fire album, which I, I thought really turned out good. And, um, yeah, as always, with me is Stephen Mott. How you doing, dude? Great, brother Jake. All right. Well, um, yeah, it's been a, this has kind of been a, a episode in the making for a while now. Um, I picked it at the end of the Wheels of Fire episode, and then basically... I guess I might as well get into um, kind of the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah, basically you got a job, huh? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I got a job, and um, yeah, that's affected my timing on doing this. And um, basically, I don't have all the free time that I used to since I've got a job. But um, with that said, I enjoy my job, so um, I mean that's good. But um, yeah, um. Like I said, an episode in the making for a while, and, um, I mean, what you been up to, Steven? I mean, <laughs> it's been a little well, while. Well, I've, uh, like you said, you have a job. Well, I don't have a job, so um, that pretty much sums it up. Um, I haven't been doing much of, that, of anything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, pretty much, I've just been... You know, watching some some cream stuff and um, trying to trying to listen to this album we're fixing to do here because I've never heard it before. This this a uh, couple times I've heard it, and uh, this is going to be a very interesting episode. I think we have different views on it by far. So uh, <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm interested myself. So um, yeah, but um. As far as the future of the podcast goes, I mean, I'll say it right now, the podcast is not going anywhere. I mean, I have no intentions of um, ending the podcast or anything like that. So if you were wondering whether the podcast is ended or whatever, it's not. And I put this out today. We're recording. I believe it's on July the 11th. So, I mean, I put it out, the big return of the podcast we're going to be recording tonight pretty much and um yeah um the podcast is not ending it's here to stay and um that goes for the danger zone podcast my reviews everything in that whole kind of area i guess you could say but um yeah um that's pretty much all i got i just wanted to Straight up say that the podcast is not going anywhere. It's just probably going to be a lot more sporadic and not not as much like we were putting out episodes every week or so. It's probably not going to be that way now. It's going to be at different points. And um, basically, whenever we get a chance to do an episode, we'll put it out. But, um, yeah, um, you got anything else to add here at the kind of backstories or whatever you want to say however you want to say it but um, well i've been i've been looking forward to getting to record with you again brother uh, i hadn't been doing anything as far as youtube or anything like that much it's, it's, except for i released a, another song with the uh, devin dunning and the great on vocals <laughs> uh, <laughs> before you accuse me a song we had done a while back um but i i released that one and um I've been kind of rearranging things on the channel, on my channel rather, and the album and all. But um, I guess that's about all for me, brother. Um, hadn't been doing a whole lot, and I guess I guess I'm about ready to get get in with this uh, review here, brother. All right, and um, yeah, um, 
on my days off, pretty much all I've been doing is watching movies and stuff like that. But we'll get into that at the end of the episode after the review and stuff. But yeah, I've been looking forward to doing a review again myself. And um, I had a chance a couple of days ago, but um, it basically, I got to watch the movies and it basically, the, the whole thing slipped past me. But um, Oh, I understand completely because if, if, I, if I had a job and I worked every day like that in a week, then... If I had a day off, I wouldn't feel like doing it, so. Yeah, and, um, well, I guess we can go ahead and get into this album now. Black Sabbath's Never Say Die, released 1978, so a very, very long time ago, <laughs> and, um, yeah, this, like I said at the beginning there, um, the final album to feature the original lineup um 13 is not the original lineup it's it was tony geezer and ozzy with a session drummer pretty much oh I, that's another subject for another day so i'm not even getting into that album i don't like that album in particular and um to me by far that sabbath's worst album but um i digress from that but um this would be the final to feature Ozzy until 13, like I said as well, and um, I mean, this album actually started without Ozzy, and um, basically Ozzy had left, and um, he was replaced, they replaced Ozzy with, a, with another vocalist, and they replaced him with um, a singer from Fleetwood Mac and Savoy Brown named Dave Walker, and vocally, I can see it. Because his vocals, like there, there's actual live, um, there's there's like a live um, audio from when he was in the band, and I'll talk about the song that they were actually singing during this review because it was an earlier version of a song that's on this album. But um, I mean, vocally, the guy sounded like Ozzy pretty much. So I understand very much why they chose the guy to be in the band. And um, I'll probably play that version of the song maybe at the end of the um, review or somewhere within all that. M maybe during the episode, the beginning, whatever. But um, yeah, he was, um, Ozzy was replaced by Dave Walker for a short, short time. Eventually, Ozzy was back in the band. Dave Walker was no longer in the band. And um, basically, any material that they had started with Dave Walker was basically thrown out. And um, other, I think some songs may have evolved from those earlier versions onto this album as the ones that's on here now. But um, I know one, like I said, is on this album. And it the mu music doesn't differ that much from the um, earlier version. Lyrics, yes, they are very different, and they have a, a total different meaning. But, um, yeah, eventually Ozzy came back, and um, I think it's pretty much kind of a train wreck in the studio because I think it was a case to where Ozzy wanted to be back, but he kind of didn't want to be back at the same time, and there were certain songs he just simply didn't want to sing on, and I'll talk about those when we get to them. But, um, I mean, overall, spoiler alert, I love this album. I think it's a great conclusion to the original Sabbath, and I think that it was very much showing where the band would go on their next album, Heaven and Hell, with Ronnie James Dio. And, um, I mean, a lot of people say it's the first six Sabbath albums, and that's it. I disagree. I mean, I count all the Sabbath albums. If they have the Sabbath name, they're Sabbath to me. I mean, whether that's Seventh Star, Born Again, The Eternal Idols, the whole Tony Martin era, I mean, all of that Sabbath, just as Sabbath to me as these albums are. And I think that it's this, the, this and this album in particular and Technical Ecstasy are both kind of put together as being the worst two Sabbath albums, especially of the Ozzy era. And I, I think they're just as good as those early albums. I really do. And I mean, like I said, I like 
I like this album quite a bit. I actually love this album, and I think it was a great conclusion to that era. And I think that it was an evolution, like I was saying a minute ago, it was an evolution from a band that was that started as kind of a more bluesier kind of real heavy blues kind of sound. They basically involved, and I view this album as much more of a progressive rock album than I really do a straight-up heavy metal album. And um, I mean, that's pretty much all I have to say as far as the backstory goes. They put this album out, and um, I, I don't think it did that well when it was released. But, um, I mean, it's kind of one of those albums... Either you love it or you hate it. It's kind of not one of those, whether it's in, it's in in between or anything like that. Same with the previous album, Technical Ecstasy. It's one of those love it or hate it albums. But um, of the two, I think I'll give it give the nod to Technical. But I mean, they're neck and neck. I think both of them are really strong efforts. They're just different. And their their evolutions of the sounds of by from Sabbath, but um, yeah, um, I've I've heard this album several times, and um, I mean, I've always really enjoyed it, and um, yeah, um, that's pretty much all I have to say. My that's my opening thoughts getting into this album. What about you, Steve? And what are your kind of opening thoughts and opinions on this album? Well, my opening thoughts uh, are going to be a lot shorter than yours because you obviously have a, a, a vast knowledge of the history of Black Sabbath. And I, to simply put it, don't. So, <laughs> um, in fact, this is the first album I've heard by them. I've, I've heard. I've heard um, stuff like Seventh Star. I mean, the song Seventh Star by Black Sabbath, uh, like Tony Iommi and all that. I think I think that's what it was. And uh, yeah, that's the only see. stuff. I, I don't even think I heard that whole album. I might have, but I really, I really, I think I did, in fact, but I just don't really remember it that well. Uh, I think me and you might have listened to Black Sabbath before an album. But uh, yeah. Yeah. other than that, I mean, and I don't really remember that well. So this is kind of just a kind of a raw, uh, from my, my opinion, what I'm trying to get at is going to be pretty much straightforward first impression. <laughs> so uh, it's going to be kind of, it's going to be kind of rough on my part, but um, I don't know. I guess that's about it for me, brother. Um, if you want to get into the tracks or if you want to have anything else to say. Uh, no, I don't have anything else to say. Um, I guess we can go ahead and get in. Well, I do really, before we get into it, I want to I talk real quick about the album cover. The album cover, of course, features um, the, it's like um, it's airplanes and stuff like that. Or I, I can't think of what you call these, the two people on here. Pilots, I guess you could say. But, um... Originally, the album cover was going to be the Rainbow's Difficult to Cure album cover with a bunch of doctors, and um, eventually it was swapped for this one. I like this album cover on the version I have. If you look into the clouds real closely, you can actually see faces in the clouds, which is very, very, very cool. I just noticed that, actually, when I took it off the shelf a couple of weeks ago, and um I noticed that there were faces in the clouds, and it, it, I think it's the band's faces, actually, which is, I mean, pretty freaking cool. But, um, yeah, um, <clears throat> I haven't took any notes on this album. I'm going straight off of hearing it, uh, hearing it a few minutes ago. So um, I listened to this album once before recording this. So, um, yeah, we can get into the first track on the album, the title track, Never Say Die. And um, I've always really enjoyed this track. Um, probably the most well-known song off the album. It's the only song pretty much that was a constant staple throughout the tour for this album because I only performed two songs, if I'm not bad wrong. And um, I love it. I think it's a great track. 
it's the one that's usually represented on compilations. This and another song, which was, I believe, another, I believe it was two singles off this album, this one and another track coming up. But um, it was actually picked up and performed during the Speak of the Devil Ozzy Osbourne shows and at the Ritz in New York, where he did all Black Sabbath shows. And this was right after the death of Brandy Rhodes with um, Brad Gillis on guitar. And I think that version on that album smokes. I think it's a great version of this song. And it was cool that he actually brought this one back. And um, that made it where pretty much all of the classic Sabbath albums, his era albums, were represented. Um, I don't think Technical Ecstasy had any um, representation on there, but this one did. Um, and they... After this, they haven't picked any songs off this album to perform. This It was kind of a tour and done with as far as the songs on this album go. And like I said, only two were performed, I believe. And one, and this being the only constant staple. But um, yeah, I love this track. Classic Sabbath to me. They kind of take the riff of The Boys Are Back in Town by Thin Lizzy and speed it up a bit. And um I like it. I think it's a great track. And um, Bill Ward was actually quoted as saying that he liked the track. And I think he actually likes this album pretty well as as well. And um, he said he, he was quoted as saying he it was a lot of good ba double bass drums on here, so on this song. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much all I got. What are your thoughts on this song, Stephen? Uh, Bill Ward, the drummer, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh... Yeah, that's what I thought it was, but I was just, I was going to comment about the whole album, first of all, that I like the drum and the drum sound also. It kind of has a, li a live sound to it to me. Definitely, and I, sounds, I meant to say that, yeah. It, it sounds kind of, it sounds kind of spacey or something, like it was recorded in like a, like a big space or something. Definitely, definitely. But um, other than that, for this particular song, um... You know, I didn't realize that what you said because my notes, uh, word for word, it says typical sounding main riff. And um, just because it, it sounded, you know, like a lot of rock songs would, would start out. And I didn't realize what you said, you know, uh, boys are back in town. But now to think about it, it does sort of sound that way. But also about this song, it's very straightforward. Um, it could have had a little bit more added on to it as far as you know, lead guitar and such as that are, are more instrumentation overall. And, um, but the song's pretty decent, I believe. Um, and in my opinion, rather, um, and really this one and, and another one that we're going to get to later is the only two that I really like that really at all on the album, but, um, not to give myself away too much, but <laughs> this one, it, it was, it was pretty good. And, um, it goes downhill from here, but back to you, brother. <laughs> All right, and um, yeah, like you were saying, this album does have a real live sound, and I seen that it and one of the reviews it said that this album had it sounds like it was recorded live in the studio. I don't know if that was the case. I don't think that was the case, but yeah, it does have a live sound. Bill Ward, a monster drummer, one of my personal favorite drummers of all time. Very unorthodox, very jazzy kind of drummer. And um, I don't know if I said it during my initial review or opinions on this track, but um, I'm going to play the Ozzy Osbourne live version during, um, at some point during this episode. So um, just look out for that. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, um, you got anything else to add about Never Say Die? Um. Pretty much just what I said. It's, it's a pretty good song, brother. All right. And then we go to the next track, Johnny Blade. This one is very, very interesting. It features kind of this opening weird keyboard intro by um, Don Airy, of course. Famous. I mean, he, he's a famous keyboardist. He's, of course, he succeeded John Lord in Deep Purple. He's still with him to this day. He played on Ozzy on the I think the first couple of Ozzy albums, maybe the first three, something like that. I believe the first three. And um, I could be wrong, don't quote me on that. But um he's played with White Snake. No 
yeah, he was a session musician on some of the White Snake albums. He was on um, a bunch of the Rainbow albums, and um, I think a couple of the Rainbow albums. So, um, yeah, the intro is very interesting, and um, this is one where, when I said earlier, it kind of this album kind of gives me a progressive rock type vibe. This is the biggest um, biggest reason. I think this album, this particular song is very, very progressive. I think it has a huge, huge progressive vibe to it. I mean, it's very interesting. Uh, that's pretty much the biggest thing I have to say about it. And um, I mean, the chorus is very, very odd. And, um, but with that said, I do enjoy this song. I think this song is a very cool track. And, um, I like choosing oddball albums like this for us to review because I know that the opinions are going to be interesting about these tracks. And, um, I mean, I think it does have some very Sabbath type riffage during the breakdown in the middle. I think that's classic Sabbath, classic Iomi through and through. And, um, Never performed live, but um, very, very interesting. And um, I can already kind of tell that, um, I can already tell what your opinion is on this particular song. But um, what do you think about this track, Stephen? Well, brother, um, the first half of the song sounds like an old traditional type blues track. Um, like they tried to keep it simple and um, with, the, with the drum. With the drums and all, I like the drum rhythm, and that's yeah. why that's the main reason I say it's it's kind of like a blues track. Um, it sounds something like if, if you've ever heard Cream rolling and tumbling, it's got that vibe to it. Yeah, and, um, yeah. because it's got that steady driving rhythm with it, and um, with the snare, and I, I like that style of stuff. But I think this, that then that was good that part of it. But then the second half of the song, they went into something completely different, and I just it's, it's it's like they should have kept doing going with the blue stuff. They they went some like you said the chorus. Um, I'm pretty sure we're talking about the same thing. The second half it just it really I don't know they could they shouldn't have done what they did with it. Um, they should they shouldn't have done it that way as well. I said it in the notes and um, I think they just should have kept it the blues way and just kept it simple the whole time but they i think what it is 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 this holds true to the whole album as well it's just that um uh, it's like they tried to to prove that they could that they could do a lot of different things with one song a lot of different rhythms and different guitar parts and all this and it just really it's like they tried to do too much really um i think they just stood took the one concept for each song and and stayed with it and it would have been a lot better but um, and I, I said that same thing about the Van Halen album we we did. It's like I don't like albums in particular that that try to that try to do too much all at once like that. But um, I guess that's about it. Overall, it's a decent song, but only the first half of it. I guess I'm what I'm getting at. So um, I guess back to you, brother. All right, and um, yeah, like you you were saying about you you thought that it it kind of the sound pandered a little bit too much to different things. That I think is the general consensus on this album, and um, some of the reviews I saw on Wikipedia and stuff for this album was basically that that they thought it was pretty much an unfocused effort, and that they tried way too much to pander to too many different sounds for one whole album and it lacked a kind of um kind of a single direction i guess you could say but i mean at the time i don't think the band was kind of in a single direction themselves and um i, I mean of course i'll get into the aftermath of this album a little bit later but um yeah, Johnny Blade, I really enjoy it. I think it's a cool song. And um, then we move to, to the next track. We move to the next track, Junior's Eyes. And um, I love this track. One of the, It's, to me, the best song on this album. I think it's the hidden gem on this album. And it, it's the one song I see a lot of Sabbath fans talk about as being this great underrated track even if they don't like the album. 
And this was the track that an earlier version exists from this track um, with Dave Walker on vocals. The music's pretty well the same. It's just the the lyrics are totally different. I think Ozzy, when he came out to the band, he basically went in and rewrote the lyrics to focus more on um, his, the effects of his dad's death. And um, I love this track. It was later re-recorded um, or covered by um, Zach Wild, who is actually Ozzy's guitar player. And um, that version was not very good it, it, he turned it basically into a full-blown ballad and um i don't i didn't particularly like it but um i love this song i think it's a great great song and I, i'm like i said i'm going to play the um original version at some point during this episode i believe i said that earlier but um i'm going to play the original um the early version of the song during the episode somewhere so um look out for that but um Junior's Eyes, great song, my favorite track on the album. The chorus is what really sells the song for me personally. But, um, yeah, um, love it. And um, to you, Stephen, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, probably the, the complete opposite of your sentiments, brother. Um, the song itself, I did not like. Um, and the only thing I liked about this track, actually, is the drum sound. I, I like that concept, um, it, you know, like the whole album as well. But particularly on this track, I think it stuck out. And um, when you you mentioned before that the band itself was in charge and did all the production, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. I just, I don't think that was a good idea at all. The production on this whole album was complete trash, in my opinion. Um, and not just with this particular song, but it, I, I just thought it was a good time to bring that up. But, and other than that, for this particular track, it's an odd way to start off a song. And, um, really, and the way the song, and the way the song never picked up and stuff, it just kind of flowed on and just, it didn't, it didn't really have like a good, a good chorus to, and, and pick up point. The chorus just seemed to be kind of the same throughout and um it just needed more instrumentation um in my opinion it, it, the production needed to be more uh more full need to fill out and stuff uh that's why i say more instruments too um sounds too stripped down pretty much like this whole album but um i guess that's about it brother um i don't like this one too much okay and um you kind of feel this song lacks kind of a flow. Yes. Yeah, pretty much all right. But, um, yeah, I love this track, and now I'm kind of trying to decide whether this or Johnny Blade is my favorite track actually now. Um, or even another track coming up here. But um, I, I, I think I'm going to go with this track as my favorite on the album. But then we move to the next track, A Hard Road. Um I believe a video was made for this song. I believe it turned up on a documentary, actually. And um, this, I believe, was the second single. It may have been the first single. I, I'm, I'm not really sure. But um, another interesting track. It's kind of a more straightforward kind of kind of rock track. And um, in the UK, it was called just simply Hard Road. And then in the US, it was called A Hard Road. But... Um, I, I've always really enjoyed this song, and the backing vocals, if I'm not bad wrong, is the band. The band actually does backing vocals on this track, which is interesting. And um, <clears throat> I've always really enjoyed the track. I don't have a whole lot to say about it. This is another one that's usually on some of the compilations. Here and there, I don't think it's on there as much as Never Say Die is, but, or the title track is, but um, it's on some of them. I like the track. I don't have a whole lot to say about it. I, I think the video's up on YouTube, but um, yeah, I enjoy this track. Now to you, Steve. Um, to put it in a nutshell, the song sucked. Um, I hate the guitar sound on this track, on this one, and um, the the tone and all just just completely sucked. I don't know what they were doing. 
it sounds really cheap. Um, the guitar sound, and um, on the whole album, pretty much as far as that goes, the guitar sound, and like I said before, the drums um, on this whole album have a live sound to them, and also this, I guess, it stuck stuck out to me on this one particular track as well, because the because the production it seemed like that uh there wasn't a whole lot of instrumentation going on. With this one too, in particular, uh, because it almost sounds like three three instruments, and then sometimes it would be something like a keyboard or something. Not just with this track, but with the hell well, it'd be like a keyboard and added into it, or like some kind of weird techno stuff or something. And um, I just I, I would like I would think the album would sound better in this particular track if um, if it would have maybe. Two more get, like rhythm guitars in, at, added on top of it, or right, and, and then, like more more lead guitar. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, I think it needs more guitar. I guess that's what I'm getting at. And whenever they do add, um, like I, I, I heard on one song, I can't even remember what it was now, but they added organ um and one over the top of one song and, and it does not fit well with this genre i don't know what you would exactly call the genre that, that this album is but uh it doesn't fit keyboard nor organ does not fit with this album it would be a whole lot better if that was completely taken off of it in my opinion but um but that's one thing i would i would like to say about this album it kind of stays true to it's like they had their own little i don't know what you would call this genre, but it's like they they stuck to it pretty much, with the exception of one track. But I'll get to that later. Um, and that's the only thing good about this album, pretty much. Well, not the only thing, but one of the main things is that they they did sort of, in my opinion, stick to that same you know concept of uh, of sound, pretty much. Not that I like the sound, but they did stick to it. <laughs> but uh, to you, brother. All right, and um. The production I've always really liked. I think it's a much, much clearer production and um, kind of back in line after. I mean, Technical Ecstasy, I can deal with the production, but the production style on that album is very much kind of like Kiss is Hotter Than Hell. It's very, very muddy sounding, and it also they kind of go back to that muddy sound on Born Again, which is a later album without Ozzy. But um, I think this is a much better production than the um, Technical Ecstasy album, but um, that's just my opinion. But, yeah, um, a Hard Road I really kind of like. And um, then we move to the next track on the album. I believe, if I'm not bad wrong, I believe this is the opening to um, Side 2, and that is Shockwave. Shockwave, the riff to me is classic sabbath i think it harkens back perfectly to those earlier albums it has this kind of kind of um doomy vibe to it in a way and very kind of a grungier sound but um this was the other that was performed live but i think it was only performed a couple of times and dropped there's soundboard recording out there actually of this track and um yes this was the opener to side two, but um, there's a sample recording of the um, live version of this song, and it, I mean it goes over for it goes over pretty well for what it is, and I think Ozzy calls it shock waves actually instead of shock wave, but to me, probably the most classic sounding Sabbath track on here, and um, or the most classic sounding track on this album. And um, I could see it being on on something, um, some of the earlier albums like Master of Reality or Volume 4 or something. I, I could very much see it being on here. And um, like I said, a lot of this I just see as simply an evolution from that earlier sound. They get into something a little more, a little more lighter, but still kind of heavy at the same time. But um, Shockwave, I really enjoy. I think it's a great track. And... Um, yeah, that's all I have to really say about it. And well, the out the songs as a whole, I mean, you like you get Sabbath, really Sabbath. 
is it's different than volume four. Sabotage is different than Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. And then technical, same way. And then this album, same way. So, I mean, it's kind of, like I said, it's kind of an evolution, a difference in sound comparing all of them. But it's still Sabbath to me. But, um, yeah, that's all I have to say. What's your thoughts on Shockwave, Stephen? Um, what's my thoughts on Shockwave? Or Waves? <laughs> the solo sucked. The song was very average, in my opinion. The, this whole album needs more lead guitar. Um, it seems like they come up with a riff and just play it over and over and over, and that's all you hear. And um, it sounds too straightforward. Kind of back to that same thing. And I think the uh, the only positive thing about this one is the drums. I like the drums on this one and the entire album. So I guess that's about it, brother. Um, did not like this one whatsoever. Okay. All right. And, um, yeah, that's all I have for this particular song. And then we move to the sixth track on the album, Air Dance. Another one of those songs on this album that is just very, very, it's kind of a hidden gem. And um, it starts out with this very classic sounding riff. And going back to Shockwave real quick, I do like the um, chorus a lot. I think the chorus is really cool. And that's another thing that sells me for that particular song. Or kind of the, the mid-chorus or whatever you want to call it. But uh, getting back to this song, it starts out with a... Um, much, uh, kind of a straight up classic sounding riff then moves into this ballad and um, very, it's kind of like some good vocals some very high vocals from Ozzy and this is kind of one of the final albums where Ozzy has those high sounding vocals and um, I mean he's kind of kind of crooning in a way it's very kind of gut wrenching as I said like on the first episode with um with um, Derek and the Dominoes, I thought Eric had very heart wrenching, gut wrenching vocals on that album. And I think the same way with this particular song. I think Ozzy has some great vocals on this album, and or on this track, and on this album. I think he does very well on this album as well. But um, Air Dance, I mean, it's very interesting. It then moves into this very jazzy kind of groove in the middle of it, and it, it's it's just a interesting song and i've always really enjoyed this particular song and i um, never perform live of course but um yeah i like this track i think it's a very 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 cool track and um the keyboards and stuff from don airy i think helps make this song as well and um yeah this um i love this track i think it's a great track and now to you steven are we on track number six? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I thought so. Okay. Just making sure. Um, best tune on the album, probably in my opinion, which is not saying much, but uh, I have in parentheses. <laughs> and, but uh, the production was way too bare. Um, the piano stuff doesn't fit with the song or any of this album. They should have uh, stuck to the concept of the intro. Or no, well, not just the concept. They should have stuck with the intro and just played that all the way through the song, and it would have been a very decent song. Actually, a very good song, I would say, if they would have stuck with that. But then they went into all this other junk, and you're, you're, you're sitting there like, well, it's, that's going to toll it. So, <laughs> Oh my gosh! It sounds like I'm I'm making jokes about it, but it's just it's really I don't know. I just don't like this one either. Uh, they should have just stuck to the intro. Is all I can think to say about it. But um, overall, and the vocals are are pretty average on the old album as well. I would like to add Ozzy, and I know there was one song that he didn't sing on, or at least one I think that the drummer sung on, and. Um, but anyway, the vocals were pretty average, in my opinion, for this one. So, uh, back to you, brother. Okay, and um, yeah, I almost forgot that there is one song which Ozzy doesn't sing on. So, Well, actually, two songs that Ozzy doesn't sing on. So, seven tracks on this album feature good vocals from Ozzy. The other well, one two, of them is an instrumental, isn't it? Yeah, 
and I, I'll get into that in a few minutes, but um, yeah, Air Dance, I think is a great track, one of the better tracks on this album. Then we move to the next track, Over to You. Um, it's, kind, it's one of those songs that, um, it's, it's one of those I don't, I tend not to remember. Like right now, I can't even think of the riff. And I like the track. I think it's a very cool song. It's just one that I, I, I just, it, it seems that I never do remember. I guess you could say it's a filler track on this album. But like I said, I still enjoy it. I think it kind of, this one in particular um, it is very much showing what was to come with like Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules and stuff like that and part, parts of Born Again. But um, over to you, I like it. I, I, I seem to remember the chorus, but yeah, I like the track. It's just one that I never can remember, and that's kind of odd to me. But um, yeah, I like it, but can't remember. So that's pretty much all I got for this trunk, this song. So what's your thoughts on this track, Stephen? Um, we're on track number seven, um, if I'm right, brother. Yeah. The production was way too um too bass heavy on this one in particular and um the song is kind of bland and really this is this is the prime example for me on the album of um of the fact that they shouldn't have been the one that produced the album um i had no idea when i had made these notes that the, that the album was produced by the band but um I, in, in exact words, it says, whoever the production crew was needs to be fired forever. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, you know, now that I know that it's the, the band, it, it's it's starting to make more sense to me now, to be honest. But, um, yeah, they, the bottom line, they should have got a producer and a good producer. And they maybe would have brought, it would have gave it a few more points, um, if you will, for me. But um, particularly on this one, that's all I can really think about, you know, was the was the bad production. Um, and I really couldn't even focus on the song itself because of that. But um, I guess that's about all, brother, for me. All right. And um, I think they actually, they did bring a producer back for the next album, Heaven and Hell. And Mob Rules both were produced by Mark Birch, who had done pretty much all the early White Snake albums from Trouble, or I think that he did the EP as well, Snake Bite, up through um, Slide It In in 84. He had did a lot of the Deep Purple albums as well, but he would he would come in and produce the next album and the one after that. But I think since um, Volume 4, they had been self-producing their albums. And um, I think after, after Heaven and Hell Mob Rules, I think they would kind of, um, in spots, go back to that. I know, like most of the Tony Martin era was, um, I think, other than the Eternal Idol, they were self-produced albums. It was basically to um, Tony Iommi and Cozy Powell doing the production. But um, I I digress from that topic at this point. But um, yeah, over to you. I, I like I said I like it, but really can't remember. I'm, I need to put that in a playlist or something where I can listen to it on repeat sometimes to where can, I can kind of um, remember it a little bit. But um, go to the next track, track number eight, Breakout. The lone instrumental on the album, I believe, the first instrumental since um, Sabotage. I don't think there was an instrumental on. Um, Technical, I could be wrong there. Um, let me look real quick. I, I believe I'm right, though. I believe that there wasn't an instrumental on technical, but um, yeah, there's not an instrumental on technical, so yeah, this is the return of the Iomi instrumental. And um, I don't hate this song, but this song sucks. I think this song is a piece of crap, one of the worst songs in the Sabbath catalog. From what I understand, originally, Ozzy was supposed to sing on this song, but refused. And um, I don't know what that could have sounded like or would have sounded like. 
And um, I mean, the saxophone, the saxophone is pretty much what kills it for me. I that I don't think saxophone goes with this particular genre that well, especially it's kind of heavier sounding stuff. And um, another thing where I say this is much more of a progressive rock album than it is a straight up heavy album. But um, Breakout sucks. I think it's a crappy song. Could it might as well could have been left off the album. But I mean, I don't hate it, but it's not a very good track. So I, I digress from that. But um, that's all I pretty much have for this track. So um, Stephen, what's your thoughts? It sucks, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, this this is one that we're gonna have a a like minded view on, brother, brother Zephus. So um, yep, um, I like I like the concept of starting the song with just drums. Um, I like I wish bands would do that a lot more, but it went downhill after that, and um, completely sucked. Um. They, they they dragged the, the intro on. It's it's like they did an intro and just played the intro riff over and over and over, and then soloed over a little bit, and then it wasn't but two minutes something long anyway. I don't think so. And it was just an overall um, a dumb idea, and um, shouldn't have been on the album. Um, I don't I don't really even think that this if the if this tune was used for a song that I would like it at all. So honestly, I don't think this whole idea to begin with was good. You know what this reminds me of is when, like, I'll be just messing around on the on the guitar or the piano or something, and I come up with some like riff or something, and I don't use it for anything. That's what this reminds me of. It's like they they, would, they didn't have anything else to do, so they just they they just came up with some random riff and just. Played it over and over for two or three minutes, and then that's okay. That's the song, you know. <laughs> but um, pretty much crap. That doesn't fit with the album, and probably wouldn't fit with any album. <laughs> but uh, I guess back to you, brother. All right, and um, this song it says on Wikipedia clocks in at two minutes and thirty five seconds, and um, like you said, I mean, I don't think this would even have been good with vocals i think it'd still be pretty crappy and um the brass arrangements were made by um will malone so or were done by will malone or wild malone it's w-i-l malone so whatever the case may be but um yeah this definitely i'm kind of like you kind of feels like a trying to fill space and um trying to use whatever they had pretty much but um you got any other thoughts on this particular song? Um shouldn't have been on the album, period. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, um I don't hate it, but I really don't like it either. I um, hate it. <laughs> <laughs> but um then we get into the next track, the final track on the album, Swing the Chain. And um I love this track. Now, this is more like it. I think that, I mean, it, it has Bill Ward singing his second vocal in the band, and pretty much he sung this song because of Ozzy refusing to. And um, if, if I'm not bad wrong, Bill Ward wrote the lyrics to this song by himself. I think it was credited as Bill Ward and Geezer both, but um, Bill Ward's the only one who had written the lyrics for this so um i love this track i've always loved this song I, I, I it's one of my personal favorites on the album and um bill ward's a great singer he actually did some solo it, solo albums afterward and from what i understand they're very very hard to find maybe i can get on ebay and look for them maybe get them at a reasonable price I do know, like, his first solo album, Ward, one along the way, that's very, very hard to find, especially with, like, their, the original cover for the album. But um, Swing in the Chain, I love it. And um, for a long time, I thought the harmonica was played by Ozzy. I thought it was the return of um, Ozzy on harmonica after um, The Wizard from the first album. 
But um, I just learned looking into this album a couple of, I believe a couple of weeks ago or so, that it was actually a guy named John Elstar on um, harmonica. And backing vocals are done from by Ozzy. I mean, you pretty clearly hear them. But um, back lead vocals are handled by Bill Ward. And I think he smokes on this track. I think he's a very, very great singer. And he does lead vocals on the previous album as well. But um, pretty much all I got. And um, yeah, the drums, going back to what you said earlier, the drums are great on this album. Like I said, Bill Ward, one of my favorite, favorite vocal, I mean, drummers of all time. And um, yeah, great, great drummer, great drummer. And um, it's a shame that he wasn't, he didn't stay with the band during the re big reunion here recently. But I mean, I wouldn't have um, played for chicken feed either. So I totally respect his decision to leave the band because of contractual stuff. Because I, if I was an original member of a band, I wouldn't let someone hold a contract up in my face. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to say about this track. And um, what do you think, Stephen? What's your thoughts on Swinging the Chain? Well, uh, I really... Don't like this one either, and the only thing I have to say is the production was so bad, it sounded like it was recorded live, and I don't mean live in the studio, I mean live, um, literally, um, and bad, but actually sort of a good song, but the production ruined it for me. And also, the only thing I would like to add else is that overall, on the album, the vocals, I think it would have been a better album with the same songs and everything, you know, if, uh, if what, what's the drummer's name you said? Bill Ward. Well, the guy that sung on this uh, song, um, so I think it would have sound, sounded better if he would have just did the vocals on this whole album. Um, I know that's, that's kind, of a, kind of an odd thing to say, but really I think it would. I know Ozzy's very highly regarded and all that, and he just came out with some new stuff and all, but um, I really, I don't know. I just don't like his vocals on this particular album. It didn't fit his his uh, voice, in my opinion, and I don't know a lot about his other material, to tell you the truth, um, and I'm not I'm not going to put him down other than this album because I don't I don't really know a lot about his career. But this particular album, I didn't like his vocals. I think it would have sounded better if the drummer would have sung on the whole album. So, and um, that's about it for me, brother. Uh, I guess we can get to the overall thoughts of Never Say Die, I guess. All right. Um, well, I do want to talk about kind of the ap aftermath really quickly. Um, they did tour... For this album afterwards and um, there's a DVD out there just simply called Never Say Die it was recorded I believe at the Hammersmith Odeon and um, it's from this tour I believe and um, it's good quality stuff I mean it's professionally filmed um, footage and I'm a good show I've seen bits and pieces of it I saw the Bill Ward drum solo from that show but uh, but um yeah, that happened. The tour was, um, it featured actually Van Halen opening. And um, it's kind of, it said that um, Van Halen basically blew Black Sabbath off stage, pretty much. That um, Van Halen came out on fire and um, Black Sabbath were kind of the old men on the block, pretty much. And um, still, I think... From the footage I've seen and the audio I've seen, I think both gave pretty good performances. But um, this was at the end of an era. Um, the album actually went number 12 in the UK, number 69 in the US. In Sweden, it went number 37 and um, went gold in the US. So it did get... Um, it did get gold in the U United States, or it did go gold in the United States. 
And um, Never Say Die actually was um, the first UK single to chart since Paranoid in 1970. It peaked at number 21. And um, it it then says that the group performed the song on Top of the Pops, which was a program there. And then, and then obviously the quote, like I said earlier, the, he said the song, um, Bill Ward said the song had very good double bass drums. But, um, and we're B-sides at that point. It was actually a B-side from the um previous album which is very very weird but um my closing thoughts i give this album a nine and a half out of ten and um basically that's because of breakout i think breakout tarnishes that a little bit i don't think it's a solid perfect ten but um i do give it a nine and a half i think it's a solid album an end of an era it was um, the final original lineup album. They were again, they were going to make an album in the early 2000s with the original lineup. They had started work on it. I think only one song came from that, and it was actually never even officially released as a studio song, Scary Dreams, which was they performed it live throughout that tour. And um, eventually they shut out production on the album because of... Um, Pretty much because Ozzy had to get back in. He owed a studio album to his record label, so our solo album. So he then bolted and went and um, made his Down Earth album. And basically after that, Sabbath went on a kind of a semi-hiatus. Um, kind of how what we've been on pretty much, Stephen. It's kind of a semi-hiatus. But um, overall, what's your final thoughts on this album, Stephen? Um, I'm going to give it an overall, uh, I'm going to give the album a one out of 10. Um, <laughs> and my, this is, this is an exaggeration, but, um, I have in my notes here just for laughs and would, and would never listen to this album ever again. So, so bad, but, <laughs> um, I might listen to a couple of tracks and when I say couple, I mean literally one or two, but, um, and like I said, overall, it just wasn't that good. The production, the vocals, the the concept of the songs, none of that was my taste, at least my taste in anything. Um, so that's why I give it a one out of ten. And, and the one is probably just just because of the title track, to be honest. And maybe the one the drummer, you know, uh, sang on. And that's pretty much about it. The songs all sounded uh, not just not all the way the same, but they had a similar pretty much connotation to them. I guess the word might be. Not really, but um, I guess that's about it, brother. Um, not We had very, as you can tell from my rating, one out of ten, me and you, nine and a half out of ten. Very different, but uh, yeah. I guess that was that's that makes a good episode, I guess, brother. That uh, that one of us is not most from familiar with, especially, and in this case, it would be being me, and um, that's usually the way it goes. And I think that's the way we should keep on doing it, picking albums that one of us knows pretty well about, and even the artists they don't know about, or they do know about, and the other person doesn't. Uh, I think that goes pretty well with it. But um, are we going to go ahead and pick the next album we're going to review? Or do you want me to go ahead and say it? I've got one not in right mind. Now, not, not right now. All right. But um, we'll, we'll get to that at the very, very end. But um, I do also want to add, I mean, like I said, during the episode, I think it was a, um, it was a very much – it very much showed what was to come with this band. A lot of the, the a lot of the sound is kind of very similar. I, I heard a lot of Heaven and Hell on this album, so I mean it kind of to me showed everybody kind of what was to come a little bit on the next album. But um, and all I like you said. I mean I like doing oddball album stuff, albums that um 
most people don't talk about. And uh, I mean, so far we've done pretty much that. We've talked about a lot of albums that um, usually people don't really talk about as far as in podcasts and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, um, have you, you said earlier that you listened to some Cream stuff. What do you, what, what you been watching or listening music-wise, movies, whatever? Cream, um, as far as that goes, I've been, I haven't listened to any of the old stuff. I've been listening to the stuff from the 2005 reunion uh, I was going to say tour. It's not a tour. It's just uh, four shows that they did at the Royal Albert Hall. And uh, I've been I, I've been studying the album and, you know, the, the footage from that was released officially. And then I've been I've been watching the, the stuff that was released unofficially. Well, not really released. It was just, uh, you know, crowd shot. Um, and it was it was this thing on YouTube called the, the slow hand. um uh, project or something like that i can't remember exactly what it's called but it's it, they got a bunch of good footage on there and they, they got really good sound quality of uh of, of people that that you know shoot this stuff and um i've been i've been trying to figure out exactly you know what what they did different because they had two months of uh preparation for this this one or this four shows not even um so, so really, I was just interested to know how different are they've sounded, because uh, Clapton is known for for not doing any playing any you know thing the same way. The song itself, he plays the same, but anything else he adds, just as far as soloing and everything else, pretty much just does off the cuff. And uh, it showed it showed up in this in this particular four shows as well that. Uh, the solo is all different, and uh, it kind of surprised me because um, this sounds uh, particular. But on on I'm so glad uh, the solo. It seemed like something that he he would probably would have planned out, but he he played the solo different on all four of the shows. But the one that made it to the actual album sounds like that something that he would probably of uh, you know it was so good. It sounds like he probably planned it out. But uh, he he did he did all the solos different and all and it's, it sounded really sloppy to tell you the truth about the first about the first two shows really sounded sloppy and the, you know these shows they had nicknames for all of them and, the, and this one was called the final brew because it was the last show on the May the sixth I believe it was and um, twelve. 12 tracks made it to the DVD and the album, you know, CD off of that one show. And that was the last one they did. So uh, they, they were really trying to, they took a while to get in their stride is what I'm getting at. And um, really, I think that's a good album too that you, that you should check out. Um, you know, we usually get into the recommendations um, for whoever's listening or whatever. I think you should listen to that 2005 reunion concert. Because um, I think it really turned out good as far as the stuff that was released. And um, I don't know. Do you have any album recommendations, brother? Oh, uh, I think I'm going to go with the album after this one in Black Sabbath's catalog, Heaven and Hell. I mean, classic, classic Sabbath album. And uh, first with Ronnie James Dio. And um, I love it. I think it's a great album. And... Um, an evolution from this album. But um, going back to what you was talking about, about the Cream reunion show, that's very interesting. I mean, looking back at some of the footage, maybe that didn't make um, the album. And I need to check that album out. I've never checked the album out in its entirety, just the stuff you sent me. And um, I need to get the DVD and the CD from that. that no, the, so one, the one that I sent you, that was... Uh that was of the reunion tour from 1968, but uh, I'm talking about the 2005 concerts. Yeah, you, you sent me some tracks from that as well, too. Okay, I don't remember doing it, but I, I might have. It's, I send you a lot of stuff. Yeah, but um, as far as stuff like I've watched this week, I mean, when I'm off, 
I watched like Monday, I watched the entire Evil Dead franchise. Well, not the entire franchise, the original trilogy, all classic movies. I mean, it starts with the first one, which is a pretty straightforward horror movie. And then the second one's pretty, it's pretty much a horror comedy. And um, it, it adds a lot of slap, um, slapstick humor into the horror that's going on. Love part two. Army of Darkness, um, kind of much more of an action movie than really it is a horror movie. It has horror elements, but I think it's much more of an action movie than it is an actual um, horror movie. I watched Kevin Smith's Jersey Girl, which was um, the first movie he had done without the View of Schooniverse and stuff, and, or the View of Schooniverse characters, and um, I thought it was a good movie. Um, I was kind of skeptical about it. I'd ordered it, and it had I had trouble a little bit getting it, but um, it come in, and I think the people that um were, that sent it for getting it fixed, they were really, really good folks, really good um people about stuff like that. But um, I watched it. I really enjoyed it. I think it was a very good movie. It did seem a little bit like there were some stuff cut out of the movie, and which it was. There was some stuff cut from the movie because of um the imp well um because of like there was pretty much behind the scenes stuff is the reason pretty much some of the stuff got cut out. And then I watched I got the VHS old school VHS version of the um, R rated cut of Jason Goes to Hell. Watch that. Started watching my VHS version of Freddy vs. Jason. Haven't finished that yet. And then I got Halloween H2O 20 years later VHS in today. So I may pop that in a little bit later tonight. As far as music, um, I haven't really listened to a whole lot of stuff. I did watch like part of one of the Crossroad Guitar Festivals. I believe the 2004 one. And some different clips from some of the other ones. I also watched like, it was a tribute to Ginger Baker. And it had Steve Winwood on there, um, Clapton, Steve Gay. It was pretty much Steve, um, Eric Clapton's band with like Steve Winwood guested. Um, who else was it? Um, Ronnie, Ronnie Lane. No, not Ronnie Lane. Um, Ronnie Wood from Rolling Stones. What's the, guy from, what's the guy from uh, Pink Floyd that was on there? Roger Waters. Yeah, he was on there playing bass and some different things. And um, thought it, was, it sounded pretty daggum good. I mean, Clapton. It was filmed the, or it was um, done this year. Clapton can still go. He's still a good. He's still a great guitar player. And um, very much surprised me with that. But um, pretty much all I've watched uh, or um, listened to. You watched any movies or anything? Yeah, I watched um, I watched a horror movie yesterday because uh, I was I was with some some people and they wanted to watch it, so I watched it with them, and it was on Netflix, and um, it was a sort of new one, and it's called I think it's called something like The Bird Box. Oh, uh, hi, yeah. Have you heard of I've it? Heard, I've heard of it. Yeah, I watched that movie, and uh, it had it was a horror movie rated R. Let's just say that. Um, it had lots of gore, so if you like gore, if you like, they must have said the F word 30 times in that movie, if you like hearing <laughs> the F word, if you like seeing people die, um, you need to watch that movie. <laughs> That's all I can say. But uh, really, overall, the, and, and the movie is weird. It kept on flipping back and forth from two different time tables and realities and it, it wasn't making it. The, the, the movie didn't give a lot of detail about what was who who was a certain family member here, or if it, or if it was a family member, or what whose kids this was, and she's pregnant in this scene. It just doesn't get didn't give a lot of of uh, you know detail about it. So really, I didn't I didn't particularly care for it a lot, but it was it was pretty decent. You know, I might I might consider. Maybe watching it again if it if I was with other people, but probably not around, you know, anybody probably that didn't like cussing and all that. But um, that's pretty much the only movie I've watched within the past probably month or so. 
I don't really watch a lot of movies, but that's one I watch, The Bird Box, so. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I haven't watched a whole lot of stuff either. Well, I, well yeah, I have. Um, I mean, I haven't listened to a whole lot of stuff very much, really. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much, I think, all of the, um, this episode of the Dunning and Mont Music and Movie Podcast. And, um, yeah. I think that um, this was a very good episode. What is your um, album recommendation for next week? Um, our, my pick? Yeah, your pick for next episode, yeah. My pick, uh, it's going to be um, one that's it's pretty new, actually, by the Almond Betts Band, which is, um, which is the sons of um, the Almond... The Almond brother, um, Greg Almond, and then the son of Dickie Betts, if I'm not mistaken. And okay, then it's, yeah. al- it's also the son of uh, the original bass player for the Almond brothers. Um, can't think of his name, to be honest. But anyway, um, that's that's the album. They're their uh, they're only album out now. Uh, it's called Down to the River. Okay. Um, the album oh, Vince well. Band, and I, th- I think that'll be a very good one to review because I really like it, and uh, I've listened to it all the way through a lot, and um, pretty much studied it up pretty well, and um, it'll be kind of a switch of roles again, um, you know, like we've always done, where you probably not ever heard it before. I- I've sent you one song, and you said you liked it, so, uh, and I'd just like to say for this album that it's. It's very much Almond Brothers. They they claim to not want to sound like the Almond Brothers, but it does. <laughs> yeah, especially with the lead guitar work. But that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to give it away too much, obviously. But uh, I don't know. That's that's the album. So, uh, what are your thoughts on that, brother? Oh, I'm fine with that. I'm looking forward to hearing that album. I like the track that you sent me, and I'm um, very much yeah. Um, so. Everybody, you've heard it. The next episode of this podcast, whenever it comes out, will be our review of um, the Almond Betts Band. And it's just called the Almond Betts Band? Yep, yeah, that's what it's called. Okay. So um, our next review will be of the album by the Almond Betts Band. Well, the actually, Band. yeah, the album is called Down to the River, my bad. Okay, Down to the River. So... Ne- the next album review that we'll be doing will be the Almond Betts Band, Down to the Rip. And um, looking forward to that. Hope you all are too. Um, you got any final thoughts before we wrap this thing up, Steve? Um, I don't know. Do you, do you, uh, are we caught up as far as, the re- as releasing the reviews, brother, or are we, are we behind? Oh, we're good. We're, we're all caught up. Well, I, I knew that we uh, we went a couple of weeks without releasing, or, or not, or without recording, rather. But but we had had, you know, two or three or even more than that at some points ahead. So, uh, I mean, as far as, the, you know, ever is releasing one every week and that concept, we're probably on time still, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it, it's, it's been a couple of weeks since one been, one's been released, so... Um... This will be the first one, and I'm I'm gonna build this one as the return. So, <laughs> it's been a couple of weeks, and um, yeah. Um, if that's your final thought, Stephen, I guess we'll wrap this thing up. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. I did. I think this is going to be one of our best episodes, personally. And um, I like doing on ball albums. I like when our opinions differ. But um, eventually, I'd like to do an album where our opinions are pretty the same, actually. Because it's been a little while now. The first few episodes where we were all kind of agreed on everything, but now it's kind of got into, well, we don't agree. It's either we both hate it or one hates it, the other one doesn't. So, um, But, um, yeah, I'm like you. I, I like it that way. I think it's a... That, that, that's a good format for us and is for is choosing albums that we kind of don't know. One of us may know the other not. And, um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Um, go check our YouTube pages, the Dunnigan Mott music and movie podcast, YouTube page, 
on the Devin Dunnigan YouTube page, Stephen Mott's YouTube page. Check us out on Facebook. We have a group, the Dunnigan Mott Music Movie Podcast group. I also have a group of my own for my reviews. Um, we're, I'm just, we're, we're on anchor.fm still. I haven't put an episode up on there for a while, but um, I need to catch up and put all our episodes up on there and finish adding everything, get caught up on there. But, um, yeah, um, thank you all for listening, and um, God bless every one of you. Be safe, be healthy, just keep listening. That's all I can say. So, um, like I always say at the end of our episodes, thank you so much. See you next time.